uh, in fact, there's no paper that I part wrote as an author or a co-author, um, which does not have your name on land, which does not have your name in the reference list. So I was wondering who, who else that is the case. Who cites uh, Professor Loon once or regularly? Just so you have a, a sense of. Okay, okay. So for some, for some of you, it's not a known name. Who is for who is for whom of you is it not a, a known uh, name? Okay, so so we also have a quite quite a group in the middle. Great. Well, let's start with the formalities um, of who you are according to those. It's not working. Here. Yeah. Oh. This one is yours. So, is this better? I don't hear a difference. No, but no you have to you get close to it. Yeah. yeah, but it's, it's just, it's the height is, is very inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> I need to shrink a little bit, and that I'm not even that old. So, your official coordinates. Professor of Development, Resource Management and Governance at the Department of Food and Resource Economics, University of Copenhagen. So that, there's a lot there that makes you very relevant uh, for the people here. And your research focuses in, in general terms on property, local politics and state formation. In particular, social legal processes of conflict over land and natural resources. And I think if people are wondering social legal, what is that? I think your talk is going to make uh, that uh, crystal clear. Now, I, I, as part of my introduction, I thought I might, just for those of you who don't uh, know you or not that well, just make reference to two uh, of your works that, that, I, that you wrote with others and that I think uh, are really important for everybody to, to know. So uh, one of these is uh, from 2011 with Nancy Peluso on the shifting frontiers of land control. Actually, all my students get to read it, your introduction, <laughs> get exam questions about it, because I think even though it's uh, 12 years old, it's still very relevant. And certainly in this context in which we are today of, of climate uh, adaptation. And why do I say that? Because in that work, again, for those of you who haven't uh, read it and we are perhaps contemplating whether you whether you should you show how, how land and forest and water come under the control of new actors through a combination of environmental regulation legislation but also violence and how law and violence intertwine and this remains relevant as we think of how land and forests in the global south are t uh, targeted for and I, as i've learned from my colleague david Pech, uh, have been committed uh, by their governance uh, to uh, things like carbon uh, capture, alternative sources of energy, etc. What uses and users is this displacing? How is the law complicit in that? What forms of violence are used? So those are the questions that you open up uh, in that paper. And the second one that I think is relevant for this community uh, is uh, your work with CICOR on property and authority in settings of legal pluralism. It's a quite analytically uh, refined and deep way uh, to engage with these dynamics. Uh, that, that's very relevant to, for, to, to, for anybody basically working on, on land registration and administration uh, in context of legal plurals, uh, pluralism. And that goes way beyond forum shopping, which is sometimes what people think uh, legal pluralism um, is all about. So yes, people turn to different authorities to pursue their claims uh, or to find a solution to their conflicts, but in doing this, they strengthen the legitimacy of those they turn to. And with their choices, they shape the relative power of these authorities and institutions. And by seeing where people go, we can learn a lot about what are the institutions and, and leaders they have confidence um, in? And so it's not a lack of knowledge that, for example, make people turn to customary actors, but it's their calculations about what will uh, work uh, in view of tenure security. 
and how best to address it. So th this, that's just a snippet for those of you who think, okay, why is that work so relevant? Uh, but it's high time to give you the floor and uh, let you talk about this interesting topic, an air of legality on Indonesia and beyond. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Big applause. Let me see if I can make this microphone. Oh, yeah, that one has to go away. Yeah, that just has to go down. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so thank you very much for this very generous introduction. I can recommend all my writing, uh, not just those two pieces, <laughs> but all of it. It's, it's, it's uh, shockingly good. Um, uh, I am well aware uh, that this is the last slot on the last day of something that has taken a lot out of you. Uh, somebody referred to this as the graveyard shift. Uh, I've heard, heard it uh, referred to as the track of death in a race course. So I'll, I'll see if I can keep you, if not uh, awake, at least alive until the, the end of, of this, this talk. But I'm going to talk about uh, something that I've been uh, pondering over for some time. Um, the role of law and what uh, what role law has if we are in a situation of rightlessness. And the talk is called an air. Oh, that's not mine. This an air of legality, and uh, it is sort of based on experience and research in Indonesia. But I I think it might resonate beyond. So this is from the outskirts of Medan uh, in North Sumatra. You can see this man who's put his land up for sale. You can see Medan is coming, racing toward the countryside here. Either he sells the land and gets a little bit of money, or he doesn't, and he doesn't get any money. Right? This is, it, it is inevitable this will land, this land will, will turn into something uh, quite different very soon. And for him and for most ordinary people in Indonesia, um, rights, are a faint promise and justice is just a rumor. Uh, most people actually live in a situation of rightlessness. Um, people lose their land uh, in all kinds of ways. This is from uh, North Sumatra uh, as well. This was one fine morning when a um, an oil palm company which had received a Plantation lease moved its uh, its uh, equipment onto village land to level it uh, to basically turn it into an oil palm uh, plantation. Uh, this picture looks like Lord of the Rings, where we, this is Mordor, basically, right? This is this is destruction. And any of you who have had a biscuit during the day are part of it because there's palm oil in the biscuit that you ate, I'm quite sure, right? So you're, 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 you're part of the picture. But this is um, uh, a company that moves into land that people used to farm as smallholders back in the 1930s. They were evicted by the Dutch uh, for a plantation. The Japanese occupied most of Indonesia in, in, uh, in 1940, and people would move back onto the land to produce food for the Japanese army. 1945, Indonesia becomes independent. We have a very, very violent social revolution, especially in North Sumatra. People are fighting to get to keep the land. The new Indonesian army kicks them off. They move back, they're kicked off. Um, they stay on the land during the late 1950s and they get residence permits, not uh, deeds of ownership, but residence permits. Um, in 1965, there's a military coup and Suharto, uh, Sukarno is taken out and Suharto takes over and everything that was written during the Sukarno period is now no longer valid. So people get evicted again. And in 1998, we have this big uh, democratic experiment in Indonesia known as Reformasi, and people move back onto the land. 
And now we're in 2016, and there's a company coming and saying, look, guys, uh, we have it on paper. Uh, we have a lease for 35 years. Could you please just move? Right. This is happening um, everywhere and all the time. Um, so we might wonder why do people who have experienced so little consistency in legal rights still appeal to the law and use legal means when they claim rights? And why does a company that needs to uh, farm palm oil uh, on 10,000 hectares, why do they even bother to have a lease when they are in cahoots with power? Why do people when they know they're defeated, still appeal to law? And why do companies who know that they were going to be victorious bother to get a lease? Uh, I want to say a few things about the, the types of rightlessness that, that people experience. Um, uh, just cut it down to three types, basically. It it's, has a colonial legacy. In Indonesia, uh, you have something called the domain for Klein, and you have the agrarian law from 1865 and 1870, which basically says that all land that cannot be rightfully claimed with proper Dutch <coughs> documentation belongs to government. I mean, this is... We think we're dealing with land grabs now. This is a real land grab. This is basically to say the entire colony, whatever you think is yours, is not really yours anymore. This belongs to government by the stroke of a pen. So legally, the, the law is favoring government over its citizens. That's the first step of the rightlessness we are, we are experiencing here. Secondly, the uh, the actual legislation is incredibly complicated and incredibly contradictory. You can have, if you have a good lawyer, you can you can make the law say what you would like it to say. If you have a poor lawyer, uh, you have no chance in hell. Right. <laughs> Honestly, the, 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 uh, the, the land legislation in Indonesia offers a variety of options that can be argued. And whoever's best at arguing that in the right context will actually be entitled. And I'm not just saying that because I don't understand the law. This is from lawyers themselves. It is, it is incredibly contradictory and convoluted. <laughs> And, and complicated. It is not accessible for the ordinary person in, in the country. We could call that hermeneutic injustice, uh, but but just think of it as, as a kind of deliberate complication of, of the legal system. Uh, and the legal infrastructure in post-colonial societies, but especially in Indonesia, you can, you can say, is basically captured by the elite. Courts, judge, uh, judges, um, the whole legal system is in the hands of very few people, and it is almost impossible to access it if you are just an ordinary person. If you are a few ordinary persons organizing in a movement, you have a better chance. But if you're an individual, good luck. It's not really possible. Right? So we have this, uh, this paradox that I mentioned. Why do ordinary people appeal to law if the, if the cards are stacked against you to this extent? And why does a company even bother to uh, to get it else when they could just as well just make an agreement with the local governor? Um, I want to talk about three uh, three interconnected phenomena for the rest of the time here. One is law's attraction in itself. One is the presumption of legality, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways in which people legalize their claims despite their despite laws in accessibility. So what do I mean by laws attraction? I think that there are two fundamental things that make law very attractive. Um, 
first of all, when you have a claim and you can make, you can convince the government or the state or political authorities that this is not just a vacuous claim, but it's a right, you shift the responsibility of defending this right from yourself to government in principle. If you have, if you have a deed uh, that says that government endorses this land claim as a right, it is on government to defend your right. That makes it really attractive because otherwise it's very hard work to defend your project. If nobody will defend it for you, if no government institution is there to say, look, by the power of government, you have to go because this person actually has a land right here. So it's, it's incredibly attractive to be recognized by law. The other thing is that uh, law also promises to lock in a decision over time. Uh, now, for many of us in this room, um, it may not seem like such an urgent thing. But if you're Indonesian and look back, you will see that every 30 years there's been a regime change, more or less. Actually, if you look at your watch right now, it should be time for one very soon, right? So it's, it's, it's super important that what is yours before and after a regime change is the same. And law promises that. It doesn't always do it, but at least it promises that. That if you have a land right, it is your right even if government changes. Sometimes it doesn't, depending on how government changes, but at least it has this promise and this attraction. The other thing I want to say a little bit about is the presumption of legality. Uh, it says here, the legal holder of state power has the presumption of legality on his side. Basically, it means that we presume that government is legal, and what it does is legal. So whatever government decides is legal has the power of law. Of course, that's not always true. Sometimes governments do illegal things. But there's a presumption that government and law are connected. Uh, it's not always given. Sometimes it's merely a presumption, but a presumption it is. We do presume that government or state and law are somehow synchronized and connected. Um, it means that if they are considered legal, they're likely to enjoy the protection of the state. That's what I said just before, that, that uh, if you can have your interest considered a right, you can enjoy the protection of the state. But this works both ways. It also means that if interests enjoy the protection of the state, they're likely to be considered legal. So whatever the government protects as a right is presumed legal. I'm sure you can all come up with an example where this is not true, and that's the whole point. It's a presumption, but it's a presumption that really works. So I'm going to skip these four slides because otherwise we're not going to make it. So. Um, if we if we have this idea that there's rampant lawlessness on the one hand and still a sort of hope or confidence in the idea of law as something that can protect your interests as rights over time but law is inaccessible for people what do they do how do you make things look legal if you have no access to the law Uh, social inequality makes knowledge about statutory law and access to formal institutions and trained lawyers an exception for most people. Most people don't see lawyers very often. That also goes for most people in this room probably, right? But we would know how to go about it. But for most people in Indonesia, this is, this is not an option. It is, it's not a realistic option at least. So what do you do? Uh, 
you resort to legalization by other means. That's what I wrote there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about representations. Uh, because people use representations of government, of state, and of law in creative ways to give their claims this air of legality, to make them look legal. So, I mean, if you, if you, uh, if you set out on, on field work uh, and somebody asks you, well, what are you going to study? And I'm, saying, I'm going to study the law, I'm going to study the state. And then people will ask, so what do they look like? You come home from a dusty day in the fields, you're sweaty, but really happy because today you saw the state and you also saw law. What did you actually see? I mean, what did you write down in your notebook that today I met the state or today I saw law? We only see these, these are abstractions. And we only see them through representations. So what are the representations that we have a shared understanding about as something that signals state, law, uh, government. Um, I think it has to do with visibility. <laughs> how, do you, how do you create legal visibility? How do you create demographic visibility, fiscal visibility, political visibility, economic visibility, service use of visibility? So, in, in my fieldwork in Indonesia, what was really interesting to me, at least, was how proud people were that they had a census sticker in the window. I was talking to people who had settled on a, on a plantation. They argued that it was actually their land that had been occupied illegally by the plantation. The plantation said that these people were squatters and they needed to go. Nonetheless, they had small houses with windows and a small sticker from the Census Bureau. Why were they so happy about this sticker? It's because government knows we're here. This is a sticker I received from government. Government knows that I live here. It's not, it's not a deed, it's not a property deed. It doesn't say that I own the land. But government can't come here and say, what a surprise, you're not supposed to be here. We didn't know, you have to go. No, government knows exactly where I am because they wrote it down in a little book and gave me the sticker. And every four or five years, there's going to be another sticker next to the first one that consolidates this mutual visibility between me and government. That's not exactly how they expressed it, but that's how I see it. That there's a kind of social contract that you establish of mutual visibility between government and and the, the resident. Uh, some people have addresses. I mean, everybody in this room has an address. You don't really think about it. But what is an address? Right? It might not be where you live, but we have addresses. Right? Um, an address is basically a flag up in the air telling everybody and government that I'm here. So people, they try to give names to their streets, even though it's in a squat in the middle of a, of a plantation or in an urban sort of semi-residential area. Uh, it's important that you give your name or give your street a name. And you should give your house a number because your neighbor did. And you couldn't, you can't say 123 because that's this number, so you're going to say 124. Right? And what's the proof that you have an address? How do people prove that this is not just a number, that it's a real address? They ask their cousin in Samarang to send them a postcard. And if the postcard arrives, it means that this is a real address. This is a bona fide address that I can show to people that I live here. Even the post office knows that I'm here. I'm not here in hiding. I'm not a big fan of Jim Scott's book, How to Not Be Governed. I want to be governed. I don't want to be invisible. I want to be visible. Right? I want to pay tax. People, this is also sometimes really difficult to explain to people back home that, that 
uh, a lot of people are adamant about tax paying. They go to the local district the tax office and say, look, this is my plot. I'd like to pay my taxes. And in many cases, the authorities will say, no, 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 you can't do this. First of all, despite your little funny sticker, you're not supposed to be here. This is not your land. You can't pay tax for it. But sometimes at the end of the year, there's no money in the till and you need a bit of funding for the running cost of the district. So people accept tax payment and you get a receipt. You get a small receipt that says, I paid so and so much in land tax. And then it says, stamp and watermark in this piece of paper. This is not proof of ownership. <laughs> and what that means is, this is proof of ownership. <laughs> Anybody who's buying and selling land will have to provide the tax receipts for the past couple of years to show that I'm here in a regularized fashion. I'm not a pirate. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a rebel. I'm a, an ordinary citizen in Indonesia trying to make my way into society. So, of course, I've got my tax receipts and they will follow the land if you buy it. Uh, movements that occupy land and have things constructed, they uh, very often invite politicians to come and give an inaugural speech because they know that politicians know nothing better than come and give an inaugural speech and come on YouTube. But this YouTube clip is also the birth certificate of the place that you are inaugurating. Right? Uh, some of the places I've seen, people were delighted because our hamlet is on Google Maps. The Google car came up and down the street, it photographed it, we can see our houses, and it even registered the name that we gave to the street. We're on Google Maps. We don't care about government maps. In the government maps, this is a forest, but in the government map, even Bogor is a forest, right? So we, we're happy we're on Google Maps. That's what people use anyway. And now people can take a taxi and they can arrive to the right destination. We, we exist. Uh, this is endless, all kinds of representations of existence also do this. Signboards, uh, public events, uh, harvest festivals where you invite dignitaries and so on. Um, all of this are representations of something. Not necessarily of property, but there are, there are sufficient representations of a government recognition that there's a community living here over time. And that, if you can't get a property deed, this might have to do. I want to say a little bit about representations because it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, think about the word, representation. The word itself somehow suggests that we have reality here and then we are presenting it again. We're re-presenting it. But first we have reality. So we have something real in the world and we make a re-presentation of it. That's the whole sort of mental mechanism that starts in our heads when we hear the word representation. But sometimes the representation comes before what it represents. Sometimes the echo comes before the cry. Sometimes the, the uh, proof, the agreement, the speech, the inaugural <coughs> talk, and so on, comes before or at least at the same time as what it represents. It makes it real. It's not that we have real history here and then we have a representation here. The representation of reality actually conjures it up. Uh, that can make you quite dizzy because you can actually see it in many places. Uh, but let's just stay with uh, with, with these uh, settlements here. But it means that property and legality comes into actuality through representation. 
it doesn't exist before it exists through this representation and it means if you are if you're clever you're smart and you make this representation you're not just representing reality you are forming it and that's why this is a very crowded place many people are engaged in making representations and of course they're not all coherent and they will they will say opposite, opposite things you will have one sign from the army saying that this is a this is a terrain for for army practices and you'll have another sign saying no this is the village of so and so and you'll have another sign saying that this is a this is a uh, an old palm plantation right? so representations are are really important in the creation of of, um, of reality i'm going to show you a couple of examples uh, of what i call improvised legalization so this is uh, from a um a plantation in west java people had been evicted from this plantation and they moved back onto the plantation not all of it, but a little bit. And uh, they realized that they actually needed a school for their kids. So they began to mark out how much space do we need for a school. And then they applied to the regional ministry of education. Now the regional ministry of education in this area, they don't have lunch with the regional ministry of plantations. So they had no idea that this was an occupied land. So they granted the money and it was only when they were putting the roof up that um, that people in the uh, in the ministry of, of the plantations began to to make noise. But by that time, the embarrassment would have been too big for the regional governor. So he came and he inaugurated this this uh, school, and you've got the most solid plate of marble here with gilded letters and the and the escutcheon of the Indonesian state. Look, this is not. This is not a, a communist red star or anything. This is basically the signature of the state, which is chisel in marble, commemorating the day when the governor came and opened this facility for the education of yet another generation of Indonesian citizens. This is not happening in hiding. This is as loud as these people can speak that we are Indonesian citizens and we are on this land with justice. They, the, um, the teachers they showed me into the senior common room. I'm not, not sure you can see it very well. But in the corner, they had this table of, uh, of trophies. Uh, this school enters into all kinds of local and regional competitions with the students. And the trophies you can see here are one for handicraft, where they came third. Uh, one for environmental drawing, also came third. And one for a relay race, which was the kindergarten. I'm not sure they finished, but they got honorable mention, right? <laughs> so these, these, uh, I mean, you, you can, you can, you can enjoy the aesthetics of these uh, trophies. They're, they're more elaborate than the World Cup. Uh, but what do they do? They basically say, "We're not rebels. We didn't steal this land. We are part of a community." Our kids participate with all the other kids in this school activity, and we are decent citizens. This is what this says. Right? We're, not, we're not proud that we had to take the, the land back by force, but that was just a condition. But what we really are is proud parents of the future citizens of the country. Um, but it's not just small people who, who do this. <clears throat> This is a, a picture of a of a um, an old palm plantation. Um, and it goes on and on and on and on. <clears throat> Even uh, these companies they they create an air of legality around their activities. If you want to have a plantation in Indonesia. You need to get a plantation lease or what they call a hagiu, which is a, a legal right to farm a particular crop in a particular piece of land for 35, 25, 35, sometimes 40 years. And in order to get this permit, you first need a location permit, 
And then there's a whole series of steps you need to, to perform. You need to have an environmental impact assessment. You need to have a social impact assessment. You need to have a financial plan. You need to have a business plan. You need to have a contract of loans from the bank and so on. It's a whole list of steps. And then you can get your actual lease and then you can start your production. What happens in most cases is that the company says, okay, let's get the location permit and tell people in the area that this is actually the lease and that they should get lost. Right? So they're basically parading the location permit as if it was the lease. Few people can tell the difference. Uh, and if you are convincing enough uh, and you can pay the local police to come and evict, then uh, it, uh, it works. And uh, after a while, you can't tell the difference between a legal and a non-legal plantation because the paperwork that was yesterday, now we are producing and this is how it works. So to make things look legal is not just the preserve of small people, it's also um, a strategy of, of companies. I want to show a couple of pictures from an urban setting before I finish. Um, this is from Bandung. So Bandung is on Java, and there was a railway line going into Bandung, uh, built in the 1870s. So I, I want to say 70s, but I, maybe not, that's not exactly true. But it was discontinued in 1980. Not enough passengers. All transport was moved to, to, to trucks. And this railway line was just idle. And people began to ask the local station master, because even though you didn't have a, an active railway line, you had a station and you also had a guy tending to the station. I don't know how, how that's possible, but I mean, he was there. So they asked the local station master, would it be possible for us to grow a few crops on the land close to the tracks? Uh, we're not going to settle there. We're just going to grow a few crops and the station master said, well, yes, if you promise to leave if the train begins to run again. So, no problem. Deal. So people began to, to farm small, um, small plots of, 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 of crops on the track. And I mean, you know, it's warmer during the day and sometimes you need a siesta. So people began to build small shelters so you can have a nap during the midday. Yes. Otherwise, it's, it's not possible. But this was not a permanent structure. And few people began to cement floors in those small uh, shelters and build more solid walls. And every year, the station master was go, would go up and down the line, and people would greet him and say, what a lovely civil servant who is uh, who's helping the, uh, the population to enjoy uh, the, uh, the benefits of the country. And he received small gifts. Um, after a while, people began to build more solid structures. You can see the rail here. Yeah. <laughs> this is a mosque, by the way, right? Uh, because uh, they also needed a little bit, bit of space. Uh, this is the rails going in, in through uh, the, the sort of the backyard of of a uh, of an alley. Uh, here you've got the rails. Uh, nobody ever stole these steel bars and sold them. Right? This is it's not our property. The rails are still there, but you can see them. And I mean, the train's not going to run here anytime soon, right? Uh, here's another one with. Uh, I, I used to have a picture of a badminton court also where you had these railway lines going straight through. Um, so what do people do uh, to, to get a plot? Well, you get a plot through the station master, who's a representative of government. You get an address, as I talked about, by sending yourself a postcard. Uh, and then people also go to the local, the lowest level of local administration, the RT or RV, because they can issue an identity card. They can say that you live here. It doesn't say that you own the place, it just says you live here. And with this, you can send your kids to school, 
uh, you can apply for water or electricity. That was a little bit tricky um, because the uh, let me see Let me postcard here because the electricity service and the water service said, look, uh, we're not supposed to put in meters on land without the uh, approval of the owner of the land. And this is railway company land. And uh, people in the area said, well, we understand. We don't want to bring to, to get you into trouble. But could you come Saturday <laughs> and just bring your tools? So all the meters were put in during the weekend by the people working for the electricity company and the water company, but not during office hours because that was kind of dubious. But during the weekend, you can get a lot done. So everybody has their water and their electricity read by, by the local uh, agencies and they pay. Uh, rent out land. There's even, I mean, this is very tight. Um, nobody has their own sort of uh, toilet facilities or anything. So there's a communal set of toilets. And they're constructed by an, um, an organization which is half governmental, half NGO, half paid by the World Bank. Um, and uh, they constructed these, these amenities and people participated in, in the ways that they were supposed to. And when I talked to this, this agency, they said, well, you know, every year we get audited. And the auditors, they come and they look at this and they say, you know, you're actually not supposed to create public infrastructure on land which is under dispute. But it is not corruption. And that's it. So it's not really legal, but it's not so bad as they want to bring anybody to justice for it. So you now have a kind of modest um, sanitary infrastructure in, 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 this, in, this, um, in this neighborhood. Uh, yeah, let's skip this one. <clears throat> um, I think this raises a number of paradoxes, and I think they're not restricted to Indonesia. Um, on the one hand, we have multiple institutions and multiple norms that guide how people behave, how things are sanctioned and so on. And there's a plethora of, of these things in Indonesia, but in many societies. On the other hand, there is somehow a shared idea of a single law and a single state. It's very abstract, but people have an idea that the law is somehow there, we just need to apply it. The state is somewhere there and benign, we just need to rid it of those uh, people who somehow occupy it for, for um, nefarious reasons. Uh, there's also, in many ways, an idea of law's universality, that it covers everybody. We are all subject to law. Even though people know that Half of us can't access the law, and the other half is protected by it, even though they do illegal stuff. That's also kind of a paradox. How you can keep this cognitive dissonance in your head is beyond me, but I think we practically do it all of us most of the time. We know that the reality is not really what we imagine uh, law and state to be. We have this idea of its universality, and we know full well that that is not that is, at, at best, an ambition. Uh, we also have this presumption that law is legal. What else should it be? Uh, we also have everybody, everybody I talk to, can come with a dozen examples of how they themselves or their uncle tried to sort of just circumvent the law in a way, in a way to make legality suit his interests a little better. Uh, we also often have this idea that law is fairly permanent, uh, but at the same time, everybody that I've talked about here are incessantly working to construct and tinker a legality where all the sort of legal paraphernalia and ritual, rituals and documents 
can produce this air of legality. So on the one hand, we think that law is old and stable. On the other hand, we're all engaged in manipulating it. <clears throat> this is kind of the same, but maybe in a, phrased in a nicer way. Because people refer to the law, we all do that, as if it was fixed. But by referring to the law as if it was fixed, we're actually building it bit by bit. We're constructing it bit by bit in our sort of social intercourse with each other. And we're constructing something that we believe to be already there. And finally, let me get back to this thing about laws attraction, because this is a really sort of uh, pernicious paradox, right? It's exactly the enduring legalized exclusion that people experience and the fact that benefits of property rights are so tightly connected to the Indonesian state that makes law a promising proposition for people because they know that law is hard. Law is defended by the state. It is unlikely that I will enjoy it, but I, I'm also entitled to try my luck. So in a funny way, the abuse of law by the Indonesian state makes legal opportunities attractive for people, even though they are almost out of reach for most people. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Extremely fascinating to listen to. Now we have two uh, discussants, probably all people of questions and comments you may have. Uh, you are starting. Oh, I thought you could start, yeah. but be brief. <laughs> okay. Because so be, not because we don't want to hear you, but because it's also very loud and brief. <laughs> I have uh, my reaction in my mobile phone, so I just read it. I will skip so many things because uh, uh, Christian explained it already. I'm Bosman Batubara. I'm working in this university as postdoctoral researcher at Department of Human Geography and Spatial Planning. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jan William Fenke and Merit Mayer for giving me this chance to discuss Christian Africa and Arab illegality. I also thank to my colleagues, Nurpaul Zirahman and Lubawun Niam, with whom I discuss your article. A Christian Lund's paper identifies a paradox or so many paradoxes in the relationship between state, law, property, land, and people in Indonesia. For example, the paradox is even though the law is most often against them, people see law as vital for them. The article combines law attraction, rightlessness, and improvised legalization to open up that paradox of, or those paradoxes. Um, Christian explained already what these three are about. In Indonesia, the colonial state established itself as a major authority on land, including through, law, through two laws, forest laws and agrarian law. Then forest and agrarian laws can be seen as instrumental for land dispossession. With that, the colonial government established itself as the owner and the regulator of the land rights. Um, Christian vividly captured what is going on and brought it to us in a very well-telling piece of article of how the state hegemonically controls the political imagination of Indonesia, with no exception of its activists. My short comment on this, uh, perhaps Christian is right that the state hegemonically controls the land politics through law. Beyond land politics, I think, or I feel like, there are a lot of people in Indonesia, including myself, who are avoiding something that has relationships to court, police, and hospital. Nevertheless, I admire Christian's article. For me, this article is a massive contribution for Indonesian land or agrarian studies. Congratulations. I'm saying this not for the sake of academic politeness. I really mean it. I elaborate my argument through conversation on more than Marxist primitive accumulation and 
more than Lenin's capitalist development. In terms of theoretical conversation, Christian and I of legality helps me to understand <laughs> that the land disposition since the colonial up to the post-colonial Indonesia is more than Marxist primitive accumulation. Marxist primitive accumulation by Meridian basically has two sides. Land grabbing, Christian talked about that a little bit, and the conversion of dispossessed into wage labor, the question of land and the question of labor. What Christians and air of legality tells us, yes, that was or there is a land grabbing through colonization and it keeps moving in the post-colonial era. And there is a conversion of dispossessed into landless who are ready to sell their labor power, power. But not only those, the dispossessed somehow was also insulted. I can add, if the dispossessed, dispossessed become the rural to urban migrants, as I encountered many in my own research in Jakarta, they are not absorbed as wage labor by the formal sector and have to find their own ways. By reading Christian's article, I can see the Indonesian version of modern Marxist primitive accumulation, which is the combined interaction of land grabbing, proletarianization, insulting, and the production of relative surplus population. Second, Lenin capitalist development. By my reading, the dominating discourse in Indonesian agrarian studies is class analysis or class differentiation in the countryside. Lenin's explanation of Russian capitalist development somehow influenced the analysis of Indonesian agrarian scholars. According to Lenin, there are two types of capitalist development in Russia. The first is Russian part, in which the feudal landlord developed themselves into agrarian capitalists. The second is American part, in which the rural smallholders become the agrarian capitalists after outcompeted their own fellow smallholders. In Indonesia, I think that is not always the case. The rural landowners elites did not really expand into agrarian capitalists. Their surplus are invested in other sectors, for example, to send their kids to, to advance education in cities, to later on become civil servants. This is another example of how strong the state is. People included themselves into the state rather than develop their own business. Of course, there are exceptions. The inclusion of agrarian elites into the state goes hand in hand with the fact that the state is the biggest landlord in Indonesia, as Christian's article tells us. It is exactly in this point I admire Christian's work even more. Building on Christian's work, I can now ask a question as my attempt to bring the conversation into different level. If the state is the biggest, the biggest landowner, and the trend is that the rural landowners do not really invest their surplus to expand their agriculture business, why then the Lenin influenced capitalist development analysis of class dynamics in Indonesia is so persistent? If the existing theories such as Marxist political accumulation and Lenin's capitalist development do not really fit with the Indonesian context, what theory can explain Indonesian capitalist development? What kind of capitalism exists in Indonesia? I'm not throwing this question for the sake of questioning. For me, they are theoretical questions as well as practical ones. Politics need good theory. If we don't know what to revolt on, how can we have revolution? Lenin himself said that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. It is in this point I don't share similar view with Christian. Sorry. I tend to see the paradox or those paradoxes you identify as contradiction or the seemingly contrasting conditions, but they have dialectical relationship. The notion of paradox for me doesn't really push you to identify the next move. It doesn't bring the revolutionary element of the so what question. At least that is, that is how I see Christian's article. The notion of contradiction or dialectical relationship always comes with the so what question. So what? It pushes you to think through the possible synthesis that comes out of the existing contradiction. To close for the sake of next move, therefore, before asking what revolution do we need, 
like the question posted by 2022 Landa conference last year, <laughs> please allow me to take a step back to ask question, what revolutionary theory do we actually have? Thank you. Big questions there. All you need to do is situate yourself in relation to Marx and Lenin, and and it will be done. But not now because we're first hearing. Okay, uh, I think I'm a very loud voice, so I will use <laughs> but, that. But, but be be a bit close so it can because it recorded. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. I will start from the from the argument that we are all lawmakers. That really stuck to me in your uh, argumentation and also from your article. And I would like to um, introduce a hypothetical case. Uh, say that the Dutch government has 1 million euro to improve land rights in Indonesia, or say in a country in Africa. And they go to the cadaster. We have this organization. And they are determined to get it right. So they put a lot of experts in the airplane. They go to Indonesia, the land administration department, and they uh, try to sort it out. The, the chaos that you described. Um, and they also sent a few planning experts because they think that more integrated bureaucratic coordination can significantly improve the situation of people and bring development. I'm starting to doubt whether that is working um, in Indonesia. And I say, well, maybe we should just give this money to a bunch of NGOs, which will make and give them a few stamps and uh, let them produce all sorts of representations. And we should also fund different organizations. So we create bureaucratic competition. So people can actually have more opportunities to create an air of legality. Would that be a good idea? That is my question to you, Professor Lund. Or would you go with the option that we have already tried? Thank you. Would you take a, a minute to respond to some of the points and then, then we open it up for uh, a few minutes? I mean, mm. Mm. Ah. Oh, uh, you yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it's hard to say which of the two questions were most revolutionary. Um, first of all, I think it, it's, it's interesting to be in a conference like this with people from um from so many different positions in a way it's not just a university academic conference there are NGOs there are activists there are all kinds of people who have an interest in that and I think that's a very sound and, and healthy thing because it's too important to leave just to one kind of discipline uh but I, I, I will make two cheap answers to those two questions I think Lenin's question was to you know, it's not really for me to say what should Indonesia do with Indonesia. Right? They, they, they Indonesia will have to figure out what is going to happen. And it's in a way also a, a, an answer to you. I think if, if the Dutch government has a million euros and, and, and fills an airplane with technicians, it's because they see the land question as technical. It's not only technical. It is super political but it's not only political it is also super technical i mean the first thing you you want to do when you go to the cadastra is you want to say so what are we registering what, what kind of rights are we registering here is it uh, and then there'll be some you know american uh consultant say ownership and then there'll be a european saying what, what do you mean by ownership we're talking about rights here and then we'll have to park them outside of the cadastra for three four weeks to figure out what's the difference between a right and ownership and is ownership absolute and how absolute is absolute uh, and how is it how how do we transact things that are owned compared to things to which we just have a right um, and then once we figure that out we we're, we're, we're going to take another week in the cadastre trying to figure out so who should have this right 
right? And then, then we'll have to ask Bosman back in, and he will come in with Lenin under the arm and say, look, I've, I've, the, the recipe is here, right? But it's not really, right? It's really complicated to see who is supposed to be entitled. The agrarian law in, in, uh, in Indonesia stipulates that every person should have the right to two hectares of land. If you take the population of Java and give everybody two hectares, they will all be in the sea. There is not enough land to give everybody two hectares. So that has to be a very practical thing. When you talk to the, the, the kids who went to this secondary school, much to the lament of their parents, they don't want to be peasants, right? They want to go to Jakarta and make homepages, right? Um, a lot of them will end up in the countryside, don't worry. But I mean, it's not a, a huge aspiration. So we're talking about things which are, we will delude ourselves if we, if we think it's only technical or only political. And we will also, I think, prepare ourselves for huge disappointments if we use the word solution in this. It's not, there's not one solution. There are ways of managing this contradictory, politically uh, tense problem. Right? And I think if, 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 if just, just for the sake of argument with, 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 uh, with, with um, Lenin and, and, and the, the bourgeoisie, I think what, what you have in, in, in Indonesia is basically government has the power to allocate land to companies and government employees receive kickbacks according to where they are in this hierarchy. That, that's a combo which is difficult to break up, but you have to start by talking about it because it's, it's not really, it, it's, it's a way of cheating the rest of the population out of their land rights. And many people can enjoy land without actually farming cassava on it. It can be, you, I mean, taxation is not a, a, a bad, uh, proposition, but it's also not an easy one, right? How do you tax people who, who, uh, who have access to, to land? Maybe well, that's, that's a, a way to go to say that the, that the income from, from, uh, uh, from agricultural production should also lead to some kind of, uh, land taxation and land taxation should not just, uh, evaporate when it hits the local governor. So there are, there are many things to, to deal with at the same time, but I think fundamentally it's not for uh, an occasional observer from Denmark to say how Indonesia should solve this problem. All I can do is to, to, to sort of come up with inconvenient facts about the thing that it's not just technical, it's not just political, there's not just one solution. Java is different from from Borneo, Borneo is different from, from Sumatra and so on. And, and uh, maybe uh, the decentralization experiment from 1998 should also be tried out on what kind of rights can uh, government allocate to people or businesses and so on. One, one of the things which is really strange in, in Indonesian law is that uh, it only recognizes individuals not communities. That change might actually make a hell of a lot of a difference. Uh, the, the, the Indonesian law recognizes a company, which is also kind of a community, but not a community. Uh, so maybe there's some technicalities uh, that, that can be looked at there. But I think there's, there's room for more than one plane of Dutch uh, experts uh, to, uh, to chip in on, on, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Let me sense the energy in the room. Who is dying to ask a question? Uh, or Who's eager, dying? Who is, eager, <laughs> who is eager to ask a question? There's at least one, two, three, four. Okay, we'll take those. Try to be brief. I should say that to you as well, I guess. Uh, and that's uh, where we will conclude uh, the formal part. So I saw you. Okay, you, you can go first. Very brief question. I don't know how far the actual law is seen. When you talked about it, it was very interesting. I don't know if it's 
universe, like a law as universe, is it what you, because it, it can be also read as a story of plural understanding of laws or legalism that you know people deal with in their daily life. So maybe I was actually thinking about the concept of legal pluralism rather than universality of law. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can clarify a bit what you mean by okay. So that's one, Mark. Well, it's kind of related. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, one of my PhD students is studies legal consciousness in uh, post-colonial uh, Bangladesh, and she's found with her empirical research that um, many people understand the state law as the thing to which they need to attend and to mediate their lives and to orient themselves around and to play with <clears throat> to their needs. But the real law is Islamic law, is religious law. Mm -hmm. and that's fixed. And so I was wondering, how does the legal consciousness of the people, you, the peasants you're working with, um, with respect to land, how is that shaped by their uh, religious um, perceptions of, of law? No, I mean, you, but there was one other question. Ah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, a very short question. I'm just wondering um, the concept of legitimate tenure rights that was coined by the PTT 10 years ago. How does it relate to improvised legality? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Sir Christian, for a very interesting presentation. You mentioned Jim Scott's uh, book, The Art of uh, Not Being Governed. You so said, oh, the people I work with are not you know, subscribing to that. They want to be seen, they want to be visible. Uh, I was wondering, is there, do you think there's a sort of a tipping point when people feel that their rights have been so violated so many times that they do? Move into this part, you know, through all this part, not being covered, or is it much more messy again? And the people, in some, under some circumstances, want to be seen by some parts of the state, and at other times, not want to be covered. Okay. All right. Um, Wonderful question. <laughs> all right. Let, let's let's uh, deal with with Jim first. I mean, in, in his book, uh, he basically says. This is an argument of a historical nature. He's writing about the beginning of states and how people reacted to that. And that at that moment, a thousand years ago, in the um, Andaman Highlands, it was still possible to escape the state. <clears throat> uh, I don't think it is possible to escape the state at at present. I don't think Jim thinks it's possible to escape the state. I think his argument is really sophisticated and fantastic. I think it's a great book, right? I just think it's a good book also to play up against because everything that he writes where people are trying to become to to speak a different language from the state, to be invisible, to not pay tax, to 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 be a surprise to the state is almost point for point the opposite of how people seem to behave here. People don't want to be left behind by the state, they don't want to be neglected by the state. They know that the state is an awesome, fierce adversary, but it's better that the state knows that I'm here than by some accident doesn't. Right? I, I'm not sure whether it's a tipping point. Maybe we are talking about a tipping point, both in terms of state technology of how to manage personhood. That has changed a lot over the past thousand years. Uh, now every citizen has a smartphone, right? I mean, every, it's really difficult to get off the grid, right? So I think there is a tipping point. There's also the question of democracy and how to make the state work for you and make the state accountable to you. And of course, if you have 
sorry. Uh, if you have exactly uh, off the uh, if 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 you um um uh what was the thing um yeah if if uh, if democracy if you can hold government to account it's a whole different kind of state than what Jim Scott was talking about. And it's also a whole different kind of state than what I've been presenting. It doesn't mean that it's impossible to hold the Indonesian government to account. There is formal democracy. There are democratic, there are political parties. They do engage in some kind of debate and the possibility of a democratic um, accountability cannot be excluded, but it's just a, hot, a lot of hard work. So I think as a historical book and as a book to, to think about the social contract between citizen and state, it's magnificent, right? I, I just think when you look at what ordinary people do in deprived situations when they hope for rights and justice, it's not really what he's saying. They're basically saying, look, we're right here, please recognize us. So, legitimate rights, uh, I don't think I write about legitimate rights and I think I stopped doing that a long time ago because I don't know what they are. But what I do write about is how people legitimate claims and want them to become rights. And I think it's not, it, it's not easy to say that this claim is legitimate and this is not legitimate. This is basically something that is being hammered out in social political confrontation every day. But it's important, the important part of, of Max Weber here is that everybody knows that it has to be legitimated. You can't just say, I want this. You have to say, I want this because I'm entitled. And I'm entitled because my grandfather was here or some other cult of authenticity is being invoked, right? But you have to argue, and it's in the legitimation of your claim that you can compare things. But I don't think I would end up saying, okay, this is the legitimate claim. I, I don't think that's possible. I, I, I think you can maybe, in the best of all worlds, reach a, a level of, <sighs> Let's reclaim the word equilibrium from the economists, but some kind of balance where uh, where you are, your claim has to be legitimated. It can somehow be accorded, but you can't go over a certain boundary because then other people's claims are being undermined. But I don't think that it's something that you can write down in a in a textbook or in a policy brief and say this is this is the equilibrium we're looking for. I think what we have to look for is the way in which people legitimate their, their claims. And sometimes uh, people have very good arguments and sometimes they really don't, right? I mean, it's really a hollow argument that you are using to legitimate your claim to this piece of land. So I think legitimation is really important, but it's, that's more a processual dynamic than a hard concept. Um, and universalism, pluralism, and, and religion, I mean, yes, of course, what I've said today is a simplification of a simplification of a simplification, right? Um, but again, uh, if you say that, that people in Bangladesh, they have some reverence toward statutory law, but they have their faith connected to relig religious law, it goes back to the question of legitimation. How is how are, are claims legitimated? And <clears throat> I think for for the people you're talking about, they know how to play it on two pianos at the same time. Uh, and and I think that it's the, the same here. It's not that that uh, I will deny the existence of legal pluralism, but I think in the abstract, people have this idea that law is a good thing, that law is a resource that we all should have access to. In reality, we don't. 
Uh, and that's why some people go forum shopping and some people do all kinds of uh, stretched legitimations of their, of, their, of their demands. But I think there is a, a sort of a general belief that law and rights are uh, something fairly universal. There's a really good uh, passage in Hannah Arendt's book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, where she says that we were not given equal rights at the beginning. Equal rights is something that we establish on the, our determination to have an equal society. It's not something that existed and that we can just take for granted. It is something we need to fight for, right? But I think most people, if you sit down two and two, they would argue that we should all have rights. I think that's a beautiful uh, statement. So, thank you all. You can uh, sit back and relax and, and look at this. That was a